Cactus 1549-700, climbing 5,000. Cactus 1549-0, departure to contact, climb, maintain 1, 5,000. Maintain 1, 5,000, Cactus 1549. Cactus 1549, turn left lane 270. Uh, this is uh, Cactus 1539, hit birds to lost thrust on both engines, returning back towards LaGuardia. Okay, uh, you need to return to LaGuardia. Turn left heading of uh, 220. 220. Tire, stop your departure, he's got emergency returning. Cactus 1529, he, he, uh, bird strike, he lost all engine, he lost the thrust in the engines, he's returning immediately. Cactus 1529, which engines? He lost thrust in both engines, he said. Got it. Cactus 1529, we can get it for you. Do you want to try to land 1813? We're unable. We may end up in the Hudson. Joint 2760, turn left 070. 070, joint 2760. Hi, right, Cactus 1549, it's going to be left traffic to runway 31. Unable. Okay, what do you need to land? Cactus 1549, runway 4 is available if you want to make left traffic to runway 4. Hey, the echo I'm not sure we make any runway. Um, what's over to our right? Anything in New Jersey? Maybe Teterboro? Okay, yeah, off your right side is Teterboro Airport. Do you want to try to go to Teterboro? Yes. Teterboro, uh, Empire. Actually, LaGuardia departure guy, emergency inbound. Hey, guys. Cactus 1529 over the George Washington Bridge wants to go to the airport right now. Wants to go to our airport. Check. Does he need assistance? Uh, yes. He, uh, it was a bird strike. Can I get him in for uh, runway 1? Runway 1. That's good. Cactus 1529, turn right 280. You can land runway 1 at Teterboro. We can't do it. Okay. Which runway would you like at Teterboro? We're going to be in the Hudson. A wonderful venue. I, I love air and space museums. In fact, there might be one or two airplanes I used to fly that are here. I'm not sure. <laughs> I learned to fly almost 47 years ago. And I remember vividly, at about the age four and a half, wanting to be a policeman or a fireman, as we called firefighters in those days, back in the early 50s. Uh, but by the time I was five years old, the die was cast. I knew I was going to spend my life flying airplanes, or try to. And then I was fortunate to actually be able to do it. And you know, it's such a huge advantage to have found one's life passion at such an early age because that kind of passion fuels your life. It, it makes you more diligent, more willing to work hard to become expert at it. And from that expertise, you can derive satisfaction and meaning. And I'm here to tell you, I know from personal experience, how much fun it is to be particularly good at something that's difficult to do well. So I've been blessed. So I retired from the airline about a year after this flight, after 30 years. Um, and I became a speaker, an author, I have two books out, one of which is a New York Times bestseller, a uh, consultant. And I work for CBS News as their aviation safety expert. And in journalistic accuracy, I have an obligation to correct something that, that was on the screen. You may have seen on this, trans this partial transcript that the NTSB provided in the, in the textual form in this DVD that they used. They quote, Jeff Skiles at the moment of impact with the birds is saying, uh oh. He <laughs> <laughs> didn't, <you> didn't say <laughs> that. <laughs> Not so much. <laughs> Instead, he said something much more typical. <laughs> As a student of aviation safety, I, I've read many transcripts. And he says, oh was one of the words, but it was the first one, not the second. <laughs> and changing event for everyone on the airplane and their families instantly in that moment. It changed our lives instantly, completely, if not forever, for a very long time. And because I've gotten most of the attention, in spite of my best efforts to remind everyone this was a team effort, it's affected me and my family the most. And for my wife and my two daughters, uh, it's affected each of us in individual ways. The last five years, the, the highlight of it for my older daughter who was then just 16, was traveling just five days after this Hudson River landing to the inauguration and uh, meeting the President and the First Lady. But for her younger sister, just two years behind her, the highlight of the last five years has been meeting Taylor Swift. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, there, it, there may be a feature film about this event. It's in the hands of veteran Hollywood filmmakers, including five-time Oscar-nominated producer Frank Marshall, on the cockpit recording. They were hoping to learn as much as they could about this. They didn't know quite what to expect. As they sat down in the sound laboratory and put on, on the earphones, some of them closed their eyes. They better be able to concentrate and to decipher every word, discern every sound. 
As the tape began, they heard the voices of two men working urgently together, two men who had very suddenly found themselves in a crucible, fighting not only for the lives of their passengers and crew, but for their own. And with increasing frequency and a rising cacophony of sound, they heard every alarm, alert, warning, continuous repetitive chime, computerized synthetic voice sounding in the cockpit. Ground proximity warning system alerts, enhanced ground proximity warning system alerts, traffic collision warning system alerts. And then that computerized voice urgently saying, terrain, terrain, too low, terrain. Pull up, pull up, pull up, pull up, pull up, until it suddenly stopped at the end of the recording. The six were thunderstruck by what they just heard, by the suddenness, the severity, the intensity of this 208 second long event. They sat there in stunned silence until finally one of the six said, that guy has been training for this his entire life. But I believe the preparation began even before, both in my family and in my profession. My parents were born in the 19th century, yet all four attended college, remarkable especially for women of the era. My mother was a first grade teacher for 25 years in the small Texas town where I grew up. My father a professional, and so I had the great good fortune of growing up in a safe, stable environment in which education was valued, ideas were important, and striving for excellence was expected. Amen. And so I've tried to do in my life what I've encouraged others to do, to never stop investing in yourselves, never stop learning, never stop growing, either professionally or personally. In fact, I believe that's become an economic necessity now, as the pace of change globally only accelerates most of us can't do an entire work teaching, growing, pushing ourselves, reinventing ourselves. I've had to. We have to learn how to innovate. And my favorite definition of innovation is a very simple one. It's to change before you're forced to, by competition, by regulation, by circumstance. And the more and the quicker that you're able to change, the more it can become an advantage, the more you're able to change adversity into opportunity. You know, my father was of the greatest generation, born during the early Depression, served in World War II, and they had certain values that they passed on to me, and I in turn have passed on to my daughters. One time, when my older daughter, who's now in college, was very young, I was driving her to school, grade school, and out of the blue, she asked one of those questions that, that no parent is ever really fully prepared to answer. But it wasn't that question. <laughs> that would actually be easier. I know the answer to that question. <laughs> it wasn't where the babies come from or why is the sky blue. I know those. And this is a real testament to what, how Kate's mind works. This is the question she asked. She said, Daddy, what does integrity mean? And after a moment or two of thought, I came up with what in retrospect was probably a pretty good answer. I said, integrity means doing the right thing even when it's not at all convenient. And that's really the touchstone of my profession. Aaron Pals, especially my captains, are the conscience of my industry. The buck stops there, mm -hmm. the power of the parking brake. The airplane does not move until everything is as it must be. What are the ideals in your industry? What do you do every day to make real your core values? I'm reminded that one of my academy classmates, and I just was back at the academy in September for my 40th reunion, the Air Force again, I can't believe it's been 40 years. On that first day, on Monday, June 23rd, 1969, there were just over 1,400 of us who, if we were successful, would graduate as the class of 1973. 700 showed up for our reunion. One of my academy classmates, a fellow fighter pilot, an airline pilot, four years ago in August, lost his battle with cancer. His widow asked me to speak at his memorial service, which of course I was honored to do. And one of the things I said about Chris was that he was one of those exceptional people who found a way to live his life in such a way that his values were apparent. 
He didn't have to tell you what he believed, or have a sign on his desk, or a poster on his wall, or wear a t-shirt emblazoned with a slogan. If you spent enough time around him, if you paid attention, you knew everything about him you needed to know. So it was actually the good part. And so I've been trying to look up to Chris's example. And throughout my career, I, I did things beyond what was technically necessary. Here's, here's one example. I, I was very fortunate. I was there and I've had it for just over 30 years. And at the eight-year point, I was promoted from first officer to captain. So unlike a lot of the colleagues I flew with who had been hired a few years after me, when the, the, the most recent accident of deregulation play had begun to play out and their careers were devastated, I was a captain for 22 of my 30 years. years. I got to build and lead a team and try to motivate people who had taken 50% pay cuts and had their pensions terminated and had become the working wounded. And I reminded them not only of what and how, but of the why and for whom we owe what we owe. And the fact that we became airline pilots, we made a tacit promise to our passengers, which is a very simple one, to do the very best for them that we know how to do, because they deserve it and they expect it. You know, when, uh, when airline pilots come to work, they're a pretty proud bunch. And um, when you first become, when you first join the profession, you, we all want to be thought of as, as competent. And then if you demonstrate competence reliably over a, a considerable period of time, you may eventually gain your colleagues' trust. And then of course we all are, are happy about that, but not quite satisfied with just that. We know that if you prove yourself to be trustworthy, and if you are particularly adept, particularly skilled for work, work very diligently, and if fortune smiles on you, you may eventually earn their respect. And so that's what we would try to do. So I, I reminded myself that as, in spite of how routine and commonplace air travel has become, what's really at stake and why what we do and how we do it matters. I never forgot, even after 42 years and 20,000 hours in January of 2009, that I never knew on any given day when or if I, I might face some ultimate challenge. Or as I might tell you now, I never knew on which 208 seconds my entire life would be judged. And I never forgot that what we were really doing when we go up on an airplane, an airline, is pushing a tube filled with people through the upper atmosphere seven or eight miles above the earth at 80% of the speed of sound in a hostile environment with outside air pressure one quarter that of the surface and outside temperatures to minus 70 and we must return it safely to the surface every time. And we do over millions of flights, hundreds of millions of passengers. In my 30 years as an airline pilot, I about 10 million miles and carried, I estimate, a million passengers safely to their destinations. And just like every other flight I'd had for 42 years at that point, flight 1549 on January 15, 2009 was completely routine seconds. And it became our ultimate challenge of the time. And I knew it as it was happening. I saw the birds about two seconds before we struck them. But at that point, we were traveling at 316 feet per second. We were so to their plane away from them. And these were large birds, a large flock of Canada geese that weighed 10 or 12 pounds with five foot or six foot wingspans. And we struck them along the leading edges of both wings, the nose of the airplane just below the level of the concrete windows and into the center of the core of both engines. And the engines immediately began to protest this abuse to which they had just been subjected. I, I felt terrible vibrations and the terrible noises I had never heard before I began to hear from these engines. And within seconds, confirmation of what had just happened, I began to smell coming into the cabin air, the burning bird smell. And then the thrust loss. The thrust loss was sudden, complete, symmetrical. It felt as if the airplane really stopped in midair. It felt as if the bottom had fallen out of our world. But within two seconds, I took from memory the first two remedial actions that we would eventually get to on our checklist over a minute, 
over a third of the way of your communication. Mm -hmm. And I started our class auxiliary power unit, particularly important in this era, it's so a fly-by-wire airplane where there's no longer a direct mechanical connection between the flight controls and the cockpit and the flight control services the pilot raises the tail. Instead, there are flight control computers that interpret and mediate the pilot's inputs and then send electrical impulses to actuators to move the controls. So I knew it was important to maintain an uninterrupted source of electrical power. I did three things in that instant that made the difference. First, I forced calm on myself. A kind of practice calm that we learned to sum it up from somewhere within us. It's not calm at all. It's having the discipline to compartmentalize and focus on the task at hand in spite of distress. Second, this was a, a novel and unanticipated event for which we never specifically trained. But we trained for parts of it and we trained for sim able to take what I did know, adapt it to fit this situation to solve in 208 seconds, a problem I never seen before, and get it right the first time. And third, because of the extreme time pressure and workload, I knew there was not time to do everything I really needed to do. But because I understood the why of my profession and the nuances of my machine and all its systems so well, I could set clear priorities even in this situation. And so I chose to do the highest priority items and do them very, very well, and then ignore the rest as being only potential disruptions. And my first officer, Jeff Scouts, did the same thing. Now, Jeff Scouts hasn't gotten the, his due. It was a team effort. And if he were here right now, I know just what he would say to you and exactly the way he'd say it. He'd say, you know, I deserve some recognition too. After all, I'm the one who flew the airplane into the birds and made Sully the hero he's today. <laughs> <laughs> the traffic controller whose voice you heard, Patrick Harden. The one who said, say again, Cactus, when I told him I was not in the room. Um, he was very dedicated to his duty also. He was trying desperately to find a way to get us to a runway, any runway. But he clearly understood that as battle command, as captain, the choice of where to divert was mine. And he was trying to assist me, not to direct me. And he was devastated when he felt at the end, and my only choice was the river, that he had failed to get us back to a runway. He said, it never doesn't work out. In fact, he was so distraught that he chose not to try to call home to talk to his young wife and child. He was afraid he would just break down, so he sent her a text and said, and it was an agonizing 45 minutes until he learned that we, in fact, had survived. You know, the passengers uh, didn't know the whole situation. There wasn't time to tell them. You could tell that we weren't going to get back to a, a runway. We were descending toward the river. One particular fellow, Eric Stevenson, had had a close call on an airline in the mid-80s that nearly resulted in a water landing, but did not. Mm -hmm. And so Eric did the same thing this time that he had done in the previous incident. He took out one of his business cards and jotted down a quick note of love to his mother and his sister. And he jammed it as deep into his pants pocket as he could, hoping it would not be separated from his body. Mm -hmm. Another passenger whose wife had uh, been diagnosed some six months earlier with a life-threatening illness, you know, a good prognosis. Um, I was obviously very distraught at that time. And at that time, months before, he had prayed that she should be spared and he would be taken instead. And then sometime later, they changed their diagnosis, her prognosis now was going to be survivable. They were obviously very, very, very happy. And then just days after that news, he found himself on flight 1549. And he told me later that as we were descending toward the water and the bluffs of the river and the high rises on both sides were beginning to tower above us, he thought to himself, this is the deal that I made. We had only one chance to get it right to do something we never even practiced in our flight simulators. You can't practice a water landing. Believe it or not, the only training we had ever gotten for a water landing was a theoretical classroom discussion. But Jimmy Skiles had been a captain before. He also has 20,000 hours of flying time. What he needed to do to help me 
And so late in the flight, right before the landing, he stopped trying to regain thrust from what turned out to be irreparably damaged engines. He began to call out to me airspeed and altitude to help me judge the height visually, looking at this featureless water terrain of the river in front of us, the height at which began raising the nose and trading some of our forward speed for a reduced rate of touchdown and uh, to get the nose up in proper attitude when we landed. The flight attendants found themselves in one of the most threatening, most serious situations any cabin crew can. I had time to tell the passengers and crew only one message, one brief announcement before landing. This is the captain grace for impact. My motivation then was to prevent passenger injury during the landing, which I knew would be a hard one since we didn't have engine thrust to make a more gradual approach to the river. So they could be able to evacuate. And the forces that we felt felt survivable and the airplane obviously was stable and floating and intact. In the most amazing coincidence, Jeff Strauss, my first option, I turned to each other in the cockpit at the same time in the same words said, well, that wasn't as bad as I thought. <laughs> There was no high-fiving going on, but we, it was a it was an acknowledgement that we had solved the first and the biggest problem of the day. But we still hadn't solved the problem. We still had to get 155 people out of the river on a January day when the air temperature was 21 and the water was 38, and many had gone away. But New York waterways saw us from their terminals, turning their vessels toward us. The first one was there within four minutes. With, by the time I left the airplane, after that, sure everyone else was off, the, the vessels were all around us and the rest of us wandered away. We came ashore on both sides of the river and, and it was so cold and, and people had gotten so bad going to be a killer unless we were rescued immediately. And as we came ashore on both sides of the river, the paramedics were there to check us out and, and evaluate how much hypothermia we were experiencing. They would ask us, can you feel your fingers? Can you feel your toes? And there was one young woman passenger, Laura, whose response was, oh, I'm used to this. I'm from Fargo, North Dakota. <laughs> <laughs> you know, in the, in the weeks and months after the Hudson River landing, I began to hear from airline colleagues of mine people I've flown with years, sometimes decades before. And they began to tell me what they started to call sully stories of long ago events that I had forgotten, but that they had not. Because of something I'd done, something I'd said, some situation that we'd faced in the way I'd handled it had resonated with them. Um, I'm sorry, say again, Cactus? All right. Joey 2760, contact New York 126.8. 2760, Joey 2760. Cactus, uh, Cactus 1549, radar contact is lost. You also got Newark Airport off your 2 o'clock in about 7 miles. Eagle 54718, turn left thing 210. 210, uh, 4718. Uh, I think he said he was going to the Hudson. Cactus 1529, uh, you saw him? Cactus 1529, if you can, uh, you got uh, runway uh, 29 available at Newark, will be 2 o'clock in some miles. You can fly 4718, climb 18, 1 2000. Okay, 1 2000, and uh, you can fly with the lead hit. And you can fly 4718, uh, I'm sorry, I missed that. Say again. And uh, we're up to 12,000, uh, 2 idiot hit. Okay, thank you. You can fly 4718, turn left 220. 220, 4718. Was that cat so far this happened, see? Uh, yeah, it was the cactus. He was just north of the uh, George Washington Bridge when they had the bird strike. Hey, Patty. Yeah. Seven and Y, I'll just put him on a 270 heading. I mean, I'm at six. Whatever you want, man. And then I'll call put behind him on a 180 for okay. weight. That's good. All right. All right, departure. We're stopped on departure. Runway 4, 360's runway. Okay. You know about the cactus. Right. Uh, I guess it was a double bird strike, and he lost all for us, so. Air coaster 70 echoes. Uh,